So moving on to another topic, this is Chris Monkton slide 13, where he says sea ice in the Beaufort Sea is growing. And this slide was not cited. There's no indication from Chris Monkton where it came from. However, I did find out the source of this uh, slide and the data, and I'll uh, proceed to discuss it in the next slides. So let's start out with a simple question. Is ice in the Beaufort Sea growing? Chris Monkton used the previous image on the slide without attribution. I did discover it was from the following 2005 paper in Geophysical Research Letters. The lead author in the paper was Humphrey Melling. And I wrote to Humphrey Mellon, and I asked him what, how to correctly interpret his work. I thought that the conclusion of his paper was um, a bit more nuanced, and, and that he, you couldn't conclude that sea ice was growing in the Beaufort area. He wrote back to me saying that I was correct in my assessment of the statements, and in fact he even wrote, human influence on the atmosphere via emissions either of chlorofluorocarbons or carbon dioxide are the prime candidate for changes in atmospheric circulation. He even continued, with so much multi-year ice gone, it's easy to understand why we have more open water in September. So it's a clear, clear indication that the author doesn't agree with the interpretation given by Chris Monckton. And let's continue on this issue of Beaufort sea ice. Let's ask what other researchers are saying. What's some of the more recent data published on Beaufort Sea Ice? Well, here's a paper from 2009, and you see here a quotation taken from the paper, and again, the full citation is given so people can track this paper down. But they talk about Beaufort Sea Ice with melt ponds, thaw holes, and uh, older ice in the region. This paper really showed that the ice that was in the Beaufort Sea wasn't as healthy pardon the description of healthy ice as it might have seemed. So again, this is a situation where the science uh, is in disagreement with the interpretation given by Christopher Monckton. Perhaps I'm misinterpreting the author's work. Well, let's just ask. I wrote to David Barber, and here's his reply. And in fact, I've even included my email to him on this slide. And I think it was a very fair email. I'll read it in case the image isn't clear on your computer screen. Please pardon this question. I'm a thermal sciences professor. I give lectures on global warming. Recently I've learned that a skeptic is publicly stating that ice in the Beaufort Sea is increasing and polar bears are thriving in warmer weather. I'll get to the polar bears in a second. I don't believe he's correct. I believe the USGS has clearly stated that reductions in sea ice and there's some stuff that has been cut off. And I'm asking, can you tell me which of our position your research supports. I think that's a very fair statement and accurately reflects Chris Monckton's intention. If, if I am not accurate, I'd be happy to be corrected. And on the prior slide, I indicated that I'd get to uh, warm and cold weather and their impact on polar bears. And in fact, this that's contained in the slide number 14 from Chris Monckton's talk. Chris Monckton references a paper by Norris et al. 2002 and let's investigate what the authors of that paper think. So again, Chris Monckton states that polar bears are thriving in warm weather, not doing well in cool weather. And we can actually read the text. Here's a quotation from that text, the 2002 report. And certainly this does not indicate that they're uh, thriving in, in warm weather and doing worse in cold weather. You can go to Lynn Rosenstrader's website. I've got the link here. So what does the author herself say? Well, here's an email that she wrote to me. She just referenced a press release in a World Wildlife Organization paper. And here is a screenshot of uh, that, that was linked to the site Lynn Rosenstrader mentioned. And highlighted here is human-induced climate change is the number one long-term threat to the survival of the world's largest terrestrial carnivores. And that is, from the report, polar bears at risk. What about other authors? What do they have to say? Well, let's see. Here's a 2007 paper published by the USGS, U.S. Geological Survey by uh, Regher. I don't know how to pronounce that. I probably mispronounced it. But here, clearly indicating declining sea extent and degrading ice has been associated with declines of cub survival and drowned, emaciated, and cannibalized polar bears. Here's another paper 
again published in 2007, also again talking about the decline of polar bear survivability. All right, the next major topic Chris Monkton deals with, shown on slide 19, is the presence of the media, media evil, that's Chris Monkton, medieval warm period. And you see here a graph taken from the IPCC 1990 report showing a period in the medieval, medieval era where temperatures were warm, then a little ice age, and then modern temperatures not very warm. And so the issue is, hey, the medieval warm period was pretty warm, so maybe this temperature rise is part of natural fluctuation. Now, in his next slide, however, Chris Monkton talks about the fact now you don't see it. The IPCC 2001 report didn't have the so-called medieval warm period. And here's a graph from that uh, report. So let's investigate this issue. Did the IPCC erase the medieval warm period? So I'm showing here a slide with 13 different temperature reconstructions going back to approximately 700 AD. And what you see here is um, the on the right hand side is modern time period and all of the reconstructions show temperature increasing in the modern period and they they certainly show a cool period in the 16 to 1800s and a warm period around 10 uh, 1000 or 1100 and that's the so-called medieval warm period what's important to note is first of all the medieval warm period it's it's true it does exist secondly most researchers don't think it was as warm as it is today and also, many researchers don't claim that it's global in, in extent. Some, some research shows it's confined to the norm, northern hemisphere. Others indicate we just don't know. Uh, you should also note that there's a lot of scatter. As you go back in time, there's a lot of scatter between these curves, which is an indication of the amount of uncertainty. So what we do know is temperatures were warmer in the medieval warm period, but there's a lot of uncertainty, and they probably weren't as warm as they are today. Also note that all of these papers appear after 1990. So Christopher Monckton makes a point that the IPCC just erased that medieval warm period. Well, no, they didn't. They, they redrew the curve based on new information. These data were not available as of uh, to, uh, 1990 when that original graph was drawn. So then on this next slide, Christopher Monckton talks about 700 scientists who claim the medieval warm period was real, was global in extent, and was warmer than it is today. And he shows nine images from different researchers. And these researchers are supposed to be representative of the claims that the medieval warm period was real, global, and warmer than today. So let's investigate a few of them. I want to call your attention to just a number of them. Uh, Huang in the upper left, Noon in the middle, Gupta in the middle right, Schweingruber in the lower right, and Kigwin. Those are authors or papers I contacted or read, and let's see what I found. So again, what about all those researchers showing the medieval warm period was warmer than today? Well, let's do something crazy. Let's either read the papers or ask the author. So to begin, I wrote to Dr. Schweingruber, and I asked whether Moncton correctly interpreted his findings. He said, you know, I'm retired. I'm not in this area anymore. He referred me to a colleague, David Frank. David Frank wrote a paper very recently in 2010, which dealt with uh, reconstructions of temperature. And it was published in Nature, as you can see here. In an email, let's see what David Frank wrote to me. So here's a screenshot of the email, and it clearly says, he clearly says, temperatures now are indeed much warmer than during medieval time periods. Evidence for anthropogenic, that means human-made causes of this warmth, comes from the fact that climate models can only reproduce warmth by including forcings. So that author, ref referred to by one of the authors Moncton cited, clearly disagrees with Moncton's interpretation. Continuing, I wrote to Lloyd Keegwin, another one of the nine, shown on that slide, and here was his reply. You're absolutely right, and if someone was willing to send me to St. Thomas, I'd be just delighted to explain this in person. And here's a screenshot of the email he sent to me. Next, you noticed a paper in the middle by Noon uh, and published in 2002. Here's a screenshot of the cover page of that paper, and let's investigate what these authors think. I wrote to the authors, didn't get a response back, but I did uh, con find Dr. Viv Jones's website, and this is the statement clearly indicated on the front page of the website. Now, it talks about the Arctic region undergoing rapid climate warming. It doesn't talk about um, medieval warm period. However, 
obviously this author is concerned about climate change. In fact, the title of the website is Climate Change in the Arctic. Huang was in the upper left. Uh, his work was mentioned as showing a medieval warm period. In this article, published 2008, you see that the there is reference to the temperatures, uh, uh, the end of the 20th century temperatures, about a half a degree Celsius above the res reference level, consistent with the IPCC. And here's a screenshot of that paper with the relevant text highlighted. The next paper Chris Moncton cited was uh, by Anil Gupta, published in 2005, and the full citation is shown on the screen. And that paper was not really about the medieval warm period. It rather related solar activity and Indian monsoons. Just to be sure that I had correctly interpreted the paper, I wrote the author, and on June 14, 2010, he confirmed that I was right. They never said the medieval warm period was warmer than today, and that I clearly understood the paper. Just to be sure, though, I wrote to Gupta's co-author, David Anderson, and in his reply, here's what he said, and you can see here that he agrees that my interpretation is correct. And uh, it's, he also talks about the tenuous jump of using their record method as a proxy for global warmth. So again, this is a situation where Christopher Moncton does not understand or correctly interpret the science, and the way you can tell is the scientists themselves don't agree with his interpretation.